Thanks, Holly, and thank you. Um, it's a great thing to be, I guess, on day three, and I know there's also the, po the post-party thing. Uh, we try, try and remain vertical, I think, is the first rule. Uh, I wanted to actually, I was going to ask you, hands up, I was going to ask you who among you here is average? Um, because I guess someone has to be. But I thought if I ask you, put your hand up if you're average, you will immediately want to say, <clears throat> average at what? Like, wouldn't you? Like, are we saying golf here? Or are we, are we talking about average height, weight, um, average moodler? No. I mean, what are we talking about? So the issue of average is an interesting one. And I was talking to somebody last night about this. So I was saying somebody sort of has to be average. Like, in terms of performance, high performance, the bell curve would tell us someone's got to be average. But increasingly, it's a real concern, I think. And in Australia, it was last night, someone said to me, well, if you say that was an average game, it means it was poor. So I find it's quite interesting that we've actually downgraded average. We're starting to see it as the thing that says mediocre, actually. And I guess somebody has to be a B. Now, try and convince some of the parents of kids who got their first B when they've been getting A's all year, and you find out what happens um, because the B is seen to be almost synonymous with a failure. But I think this is an interesting question about average because I want to look at Tyler, Cow Tyler Cowan saying about average is over, that we're finished with average, that, and that what, what's happening is technology is wiping average out. I want us to come back to that question, but the first thing I want us to look at is this question of what you're average at. Now, I want us to do this this morning. It's not just going to be me. We're going to, we're going to be doing some interactivity. And I want to particularly use some techniques that I use in classrooms and I see other teachers use, some really good teachers use. And I, I want to do this because if we're really going to make sure that something like MoodleNet gets going or that, that, that the platforms that we're using are used optimally, then the disposition to collaborate has to be fundamental. And it, while it, it might be that people think, oh, well, it's all right, yes, we do group work. You know, I think you would know, you, you people who, who've done more work on this, that collaboration is more than group work. You know, that, that, that working as collaborators, as close collaborators, that we all fly higher together than each one of us can, that no one of us is as smart as all of us can be, that that principle underpins a lot of the work you're trying to do, uh, and the, it underpins you know, how do we get platforms working optimally. Well, we've got to have the disposition to use them as collaborators, and that's not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing. So we're actually going to do some of that this morning. I'm going to model on some of the, the good teaching I've seen. Some of you will know this. See three before me. See other pe three other people, and I see some terrific forums that work this way. You see three other people before me. Now, to do that, we're going to, we're going to do that. I'm going to actually get you to work in awesome foursomes. Now, I know that there are some, some, some are set up, so here's a seven, which is a bit of a problem. Um, there's a, there's a, but there's a seven over there, so this kind person could just turn around, then we end up with a foursome. Um, and I think because we're all intelligent, capable adults that can add to four, I'm presuming we can pretty quickly get ourselves in a foursome. Now, if you find yourself in some sort of eeksome, threesome, or whatever it is, that's all, we, we can cope with that, but if we can try to create a foursome for ourselves, because we're going to put this principle into play, and we're going to be having a, a professional conversation around some of this. So could I ask you to make up your awesome foursome? There may be eight of you at the table, and ma that makes it easy. You've got shoulder pairs, if you like. Perfect. Look at this. No, well, you were planning it early. 
four, four. Are there any strays or orphans? How are we going? Good. Could I ask you in your foursome, share in your foursome, we'll just take a few couple of minutes on this, three or four minutes, share in your foursome what you think you are average at. Now I'd say gardening maybe and driving. I'm not awful, I'm not wonderful, you know. Share what you think you are average at, where you go. Microphone. There are, there are two. to get a couple of this end and then we'll go up there just to hear a couple just here, just here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. in a minute and alive some five some eh? yeah. oh. we can cope with No, it's just share it. No, you don't all have to be average. Thanks, folks. I didn't expect you to all be average together, so you didn't have to work out. But just some of the things, we've got a couple of microphones, just to hear a couple of things that we're saying without great apology and embarrassment that we're average at. Can you just grab somebody there who's willing to volunteer their averageness? I, I, I'm, Sorry. Yes, I, I was an average chess player. Average chess player? Sport. Can we hear? Average typer. Typer, right? Fashion. 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 What does? <laughs> what does that mean? So self-presentation is just in the middle there. Well, sorry. Okay, parenting. Right. A lot of us would see ourselves in that basket, I'd suppose. <laughs> you know, um, I mean that we that we catch ourselves sometimes, and and I mean every for every parent who thinks, well, that didn't go very well, you know, <laughs> that that move wasn't a good idea, um, and and I think there are times too when we think this is great, but um, most of our time we you know, we're trying to do our best, but maybe we're not sort of there, and I. Again, difficult in this era. I mean, you will not hear Donald Trump ever say he's average at anything. <laughs> he either uses terms like, you know, tremendous and wonderful or horrible and awful. There is nothing in the middle, absolutely nothing. 
And I have asked a few people about what they're average at, and they say, well, I'm not very good at this. I said, well, no, and I'm asking what you're average at. Oh, well, I'm not, yeah, I'm, I, I think I'm below par. So it's interesting what we carry around in our heads, you know, what the self-talk is about uh, and how we understand that. And I, I'm coming particularly to this issue of, of the times we're in, when we're talking about average, because this is what I'm seeing. I just put this up. This is, I found this. It made me lose the will to live when I was on a, in a, a primary school. And it was about, it's about this age of the marvellous me and setting kids up for the idea that they are incredibly special. And this was on a wall, the year twos. Look at me, I'm special. In the whole world, there's no one just like me. I'm unique and wonderful and amazing. We've gone through a time where we think it, this, is, this is building up self-esteem. This is terrific. And it's somewhat different from the way... When I went to school, you were treated like you'd come in on somebody's shoe, you know? <laughs> So we, we didn't get this. We got, I remember one of our maths teachers, when he said, oh, when he came in the, with, the, with the papers under his arm, he said, I won't ask you to form a circle. Um, I won't ask you to stand. He said, you might conceivably form a circle and then I'd be rested for running a dope ring. Now, of course, he thought that was very funny, but, but um, that's the way we, we were sort of talked to. We didn't have names. One of my brothers it was a, a very good math student, but his name was in the corner. So anybody any, in the corner? That, the, the, you know, the t that was in those times. And that was a time of when we thought that learning was high threat and high challenge. And teachers were perversely determined not to be understood, and, and you're asking people to jump high. Now, we are in a different time now. And I think the difficulty here is we've gone from a high threat, high challenge. My, uncle used to say, you may breathe occasionally. <laughs> and we went from that to every kitty wins a prize, which is, you know, part of the, this uh, thing now. And I want to get to it because I think one of the tough calls here is if we're trying to think about being future ready, it's not going to be a cinch. And if we're saying to kids, you're special, you can just do anything, just believe in yourself and just we sing, keep your sunny side up, you know? And, and I think, well, maybe that's not enough. They've actually got to build the skills to be collaborators. Because the way they're going to become part of the dynamic, successful learning world is to be collaborators. They are not going to be able to simply be special and say, here I am, world, look at me. So, Recently, here's a Gen Y, we were raised on a diet of constant reinforcement, told we could do anything, keen to boost our self-esteem. Mum and Dad sacrificed their weekends to show for us from soccer to ballet to drama to nippers. Seem, you know, uh, something that is familiar? Our teachers showered us with unjustifiable praise. In kindergarten, I won an award for tying my shoelaces a week later than everyone else. In year seven, I won a ribbon for not finishing a cross-country run. <laughs> now, so, so now, because we've elevated self-esteem and we, and we believe that if you've got high self-esteem, you can do anything. It's just got to be confident. And I see these things on walls in schools. You know, believe in yourself. You can just get there if you really try. Well, probably not. You know, I mean, history teaches us that people united would probably be defeated. And it's not so easy to explain, uh, you know, that, that that sort of what I'd call stupid optimism. Now, I'm actually on about non-stupid optimism. I think it's really important for us to be optimistic, but to also be informed and to have a sense of authenticity. So I think what we've done is we've, we've swung wildly from the teacher as dictator and the kid as the worm and the germ, and we've swung over to children as um, all things that are possible, and of course, all knowing and, and wonderful. My grandmother would have been amazed at the idea that we should ask kids what they want. And I know, no, I talk to parents now, I say, of course, you wouldn't stand a three-year-old in front of the fridge and say, what would you like to drink? Oh, wouldn't you? No, you wouldn't. You'd say, would you like water or milk? Oh, hmm. yes, no, because you, you give them a, a choice, but a very small choice. You don't give them any choice. Oh, 
because they're not that special. And you are the parent, even if you're an average parent, you know, you're a parent. So that's, that's a background for us as we're trying to build this disposition to collaborate. And meanwhile, difficulties become repugnant. Uh, denies entitlement, disenchants potential, limits mobility and flexibility, delays gratification, distracts from distraction. When you think about the fact that we, we expect things to be easy and instantly successful. And for a lot of our kids who are wanting easy, instant success, I mean, who wouldn't? Of course we want that. Great. Let me do it quickly. It's got to be perfect. The screen tells us it can be perfect. You get rid of all the imperfections. You don't have the old thing about writing it out and then having to scratch things and you can see all the imperfections. No, it clears all that out so it can, be, it can be instant and easy and perfect. And we can move quickly then to do things. So that's the expectation. So we don't have to tie shoelaces anymore, for example, because we can just get Velcros, you know, done. And, and that makes for e ease of doing things. Again, why wouldn't we want easy? Why wouldn't we want to use the escalator instead of the stairs? I won't ask you if you did today. <laughs> I know what I did. So, as we're trying to, to, to say, uh, learning and the disposition to learn is going to be increasingly important, and a lot of the learning that they're going to be doing is going to be informal, then what we really need to do is think about this disposition to engage with others not just, I'll put you in a group, and I know what a lot of our university students say, oh, do I have to be in a group? I'm sure you've done this. Oh, no, group assignment. Oh, God. Can I just do it by myself, please? No, well, we, we, you're going to be doing a group. Now, when I create groups at university, I always put a married woman as the head of the group. <laughs> a, woman, a married woman with kids, because she will be as organised as all get out, and she will solve every problem. And they only come to me, C3 before me, put her in there. How many kids you got? Three. Terrific. <laughs> you get to be the sheriff of the group and don't come to me before you've been to her. Now, that's terribly exploitative of women, I know, but <laughs> it's just pure self-interest on my part. <laughs> okay, so, um, I think this is, this is the what Foley is saying. And I want to come then to, to the basic thesis that I took up, because Cowan wrote this five years ago, and I want us to have a think about what this actually looks like now. Is there real evidence for this or not? He says that we're moving to a hyper-meritocracy, and he says it's clear. The world is demanding more in the way of credentials, more in the way of ability, and it's passing along most of the higher awards to a relatively small cognitive elite. Now, we might think that's us, or we might think we're average. Um, we might think it's us until we meet somebody who really is, uh, flashes a rap with a gold tooth, and then we think, oh, you know, I think I'm just average. So, so here's, here's the point, and I guess it's for people like this, if you don't know who she is, Raya Hadsall is a woman she was the only female keynote at the Deep Learning Conference in San Francisco last year. And I'll say to the women here particularly, and this is an issue for us in technology, the, um, there were 85% men at that conference and 15% women. And the women were in the booths, looking terrific, fabulous hair, teeth beautiful. They're back in the booths. Only one woman who's actually doing a keynote. And this is, this is a, a real concern. Now, this woman, uh, Raya Hadsell, if you look at her, she didn't do STEM. I, I find this quite interesting about how did she get through. Her mother was an artist. What, it, what was her undergraduate degree? It was philosophy and religious studies. Now, she loved doing puzzles, and she did do a postgraduate degree in computer science. Obviously, she would need to have done that. But, but she didn't have a traditional path. So it's, she didn't come through STEM. And so I think we need to be thinking about, so what is it that, that gave her that edge, that cognitive edge, that allowed her to push through? But she's a rare person here. Um, she's part of, I guess, what Cowan would call the hyper-meritocracy. 
and it is looking pretty gendered, and it's all pretty, the Silicon Valley is looking a bit like that too. So, so we have to ask ourselves, you know, what does this mean? Is, there, is the evidence in on this? What do we think? Just to flesh it out a little bit more, if we think about global labour markets um, in these terms, not, not in terms of blue collar, white collar, anything, we, we've sort of done with that. But if we think about it in terms of personal services, high-end personal services, I guess the highest would be something like brain surgery, that'd be pretty high-end personal service, or uh, divorce law, you know, they'd be high-end personal services, where a person is there. Although, of course, increasing with brain surgery, robotics are doing it for us, and that's one of the issues here. Low-end personal services, uh, and this is Alan Binder's work in particular, low-end personal services, cleaning out somebody's toilet would be a low-end personal service, I guess, you know. Uh, babysitting, low-end personal service. Uh, robots are doing that better, actually, these days, because they can work out if a baby's heart stops beating, and babysitters don't normally do that. <laughs> it's all too late, you know. Then, <clears throat> and then we can see high-end impersonal services. Now, those are the things that you could do so that the person who's doing the lighting plot for Central Park lives in Amsterdam, not New York, you know, and so that's a high-end impersonal service. And so he runs all that from there. Low-end impersonal is, is uh, all the sort of stuff that's done in, with freelancer and Odesk and those sorts of jobs which are paid by the, by the task or, or low pay by the hour. Uh, nothing for, no, no time off to go to the toilet even, uh, and certainly no, no superannuation attached or holiday pay or any of those sorts of things. Now the move of, that, that Cowan and others are talking about, is, the move of course is, is from personal to impersonal. Because bodies cost, I mean bodies cost uh, at least seven times as much as if you can get a, a, a robot to do something, then you'll pay much less. And of course, robots don't need to sleep and they don't get sick and all those things, but we know. Um, and of course, again, if we can make things uh, impersonal, if we, at that low end, we'll do that too. It's interesting to me some of the jobs that, that robots can't do. Do you know what the one is that they are least likely to be able to do? Hairdressing. But they can't do it because everybody, it's not just, when I look around this room, you know, it's not just that everybody's head is unique, uh, and there's, no, and there's no generic model to work out, but also because our style is unique. You know, we, we say, oh no, I, I like it a bit like that. No, it's, that's a bit long. And we just have this way of, of thinking about it. So, so when you put together your style with with your funny head, if I just, you know, I've got a funny head too, um, it means that hairdressers' jobs are safe. But most, most others are in trouble, or parts of them are, including parts of teachers' jobs. Now, the basic thing is, if it can be made impersonal, it will be, and if it can be made low-end, it will be, because that lowers cost. So, Putting all that together, that's the picture. Now, what Cowan says is this. He says, we're going to wipe out the middle here. That those, the middle things that were part of this, if we go back, the middle end of, say, personal, those, those people who are public accountants, people of that sort, who used to step up human relations people, the people who occupy that middle ground of corporate, that group of people, are going to increasingly disappear. You know, real estate agents, that, that's, there's a whole group of people that we might see to be in that middle section. He says they're going to go and, and that, that technology is a wave that will either lift us or dump us. And that basically what it's going to do is wipe out the big raiders. Now, I, I was at a think tank in Zurich uh, last year where I was talking to some young people, and unfortunately they were all young men. Again, this worries me a bit. But there were a number of, there were four young men there, and they were saying at this IBM think tank, they were saying, um, oh, we're not going to do undergraduate university. We're going straight. We've been working on stuff. We're going to skip university, 
and we're, we're going to get a leapfrog our undergraduate degree. We're going to expect credit for what we're produce, putting together in the way of the apps that we're working on or the cultural products that we've got. And we're, we're going to skip over that. Now, that's the real possibility there, and I think this is evidence to support what Cowan's saying, is that the B graders may end up going to university and the A graders go somewhere else. And especially when so much of the sort of learning we're talking about is going to be informal. 90% of it's going to be informal, we're being told. So the learning to learn is going to be really a very powerful part of this disposition that yeah, people will learn on the run and unlearn as well. And let's not underestimate how important unlearning is. It's much harder to unlearn because once you've learned something, you cling to it. And then to have to unlearn it is difficult. And I'm just thinking even in terms of the... Uh, I've never got used to the idea of the, the you know, thing on, on, the, on my vehicle, you know, where you, where you, what's it called? Where I have the car running and then I take my feet off, the cruise control. I don't even want to talk about it. I don't know. Um, but I've, I just, because I've learned how to drive, the whole idea that I have to unlearn, you know, that, and that I'm somehow then, it's almost as though the car's taken over and I get, so um, now I know that it's it's I know that it's smarter to use it, especially if I'm, there's not a lot of traffic around. And I don't have to worry about constantly looking down to see. But but I just know that I've already learned how to drive. Just what I'm saying. I'm an average driver because I think a lot of us would probably who doesn't who doesn't use cruise control even though they've got it in the car. A few of us. Okay. Well, maybe we're just a special group. <laughs> uh, uh, another not so awesome foursome. Okay, so, so this is this is what 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 Tyler Cowan has said, and um, this is 2013. He's saying five years ago he's saying we're going to wipe out the middle, basically, and that technology is going to wipe out people who are who are B grade, who are average at things, who are average at routine transactions who basically will plod through and hand up. It's not fabulous, it's not awful, who need to be told things, who need to be given, who need to be given a template, away you go. Uh, people who you know, perhaps take a little bit longer than others, but that that group is going to be taken away. So I want us to have a think about that issue, what he's saying, that that... The world is demanding more in the way of ability. Is it true? Are we seeing that now? Are we seeing, and thinking back from your experience, I'm going to get you in foursomes now to have a talk about this. In your own experience, do you see evidence that that is happening? That we're, people are either being pushed up or, or, or they're being dropped down and that we're seeing the hollowing out of our B graders? B grade jobs, B grade, uh, and, and that the people who once went into, I guess, were public service jobs, is that true? Or, have, or has he overestimated? Are we creating a whole lot of new things for, if you like, standard people, average people to do? Have a talk, just a few minutes, thank you. Great certificates. We're talking about the crash in Vernon, they get built up, especially if you've got some people get built up. You get all these certificates, they don't mean much. 
And I think a lot of the mental health problems come from that. That kids think the world's here, except... You need the average people. Yeah. Yeah. You need the average incomes to supply you know, the buying. And you can apply to economics as well. You get the, the, the rich get richer, they're in the middle, quite often fun there. If you don't have the middle, where do you go? How do you, how do you get to the top without going to the average? I just ask now, we, we've started that conversation. Who's heard something? Who's heard something that's worth sharing? Just dob in one of the people at your table. I heard something over. over I'll, I'll start over here. There was one thing that was said about about the wiping out of the middle. Just as a, as a comment, we just pick up a few of these comments from people. Um, uh, and thoughts about it. disconfirming evidence or maybe confirming. Thanks. So, yeah, my question was um, how do you get to the top if you don't go through the middle? So, so how do we get to the top if we don't go through the middle? Uh, I guess we think about it. Is, is that, that projection has to be the way that we, that we become okay at something before we, become, we just don't suddenly become good. Um, and I guess that's part of the issue of what it means to learn that we're not fabulous. Are there other comments that people heard that are worth listening to? Down, down the end there. On my left wing. Thanks. Um, in our table here, we're talking about it, and we thought there will always be an average there. So if you wipe or remove that average layer, maybe the bottom layer of the top and the higher layer of the bottom there is going to make the new average layer. That's, that's another. Okay. That's one thing. Another thing is uh, personal. I think technology is not going to be advanced enough to wipe that average layer all the time. Okay. So you're going to say it reconfigures what counts as average. Yep. yep. Right behind you. Thanks. Well, we were discussing um, about how it seems like the the average is widening rather than being uh -huh. um, pushed okay. out because you know your basic level data analyst entry level position in an area requires a bachelor's degree. So everyone's going to university, everyone's doing a bachelor of okay. arts or something that they believe is simple, scraping through on a P's make degrees mentality so they get that bachelor's and then they start at the bottom level being told that they're the next CEO or chief of staff or whatever and then they, you know, cutthroat their way all the way up to the top when you know they, they see everybody else before thinking you've got to start somewhere at the top before you start at the bottom kind of thing. So. And this is one of the points that's made here about when we start giving certificates for everything, you know, that you, if you can remain vertical in the seat, you get a certificate. It does set up a false sense of, uh, you know, as I come out of university, where's my 
office chair and my, you know, my air-conditioned office with the leather stuff. Uh, and, and maybe part of the problem I'm saying about, about the mental health of our young people is that, that their sense of being superior and, and special and terrific, that you, they can do anything, and then they find, no, they can't. Uh, it's a really interesting point that you're saying, that maybe, we, maybe the whole average will be what most people will be most of the time. And we're, we're actually thinning out the other two ends. Might well be. I mean, I just think it's interesting that we shouldn't just swallow this. You know, we don't open our mouth and say, well, he must be right. The very useful comments there. We have a couple, well, we haven't heard from the right wing yet, but we can just do one of those. I, I actually think average is increasing. Like, twice they've reset the IQ because um, our ability is getting okay. better because of education. Um, but the point I was going to say is I'm looking forward to and also fearful of the day I walk into a cafe and I'm served by a robot controlled by artificial intelligence or a nursing home or something else because robots don't get angry. Um, as you said, yes. they can measure heart rates and so on yes. like that so they know if the patient's oh, no. alive. You know, th there's a whole lot of average workers in that place that could easily be replaced by robots. Yeah. And I think to some extent, some teachers could be replaced. Well, parts of their job will be, but um, I found it interesting, just recently in Japan, they've created a robots for kids to learn where the robots are, are deliberately designed as dumb. Or at least, if not dumb, they're designed just to be sort of a little bit thick. <laughs> and, and the kids love teaching them, because th they're designed to say, oh, I, yeah, and to get something slightly wrong, so that kids can go, no, that's not right. This is what it is. And the robot says, oh, thank you for that. You know, you've taught me something. And they're, they're saying that if you, you can help kids learn by not giving them really smart robots, but giving them robots that are designed to be a little bit dumb. So there's an interesting possible development too. We might have average robots, who knows? Huh? <laughs> yes. But they're certainly, in the re they're certainly at the reception of Amazon, you know, if you go to a hotel. And, I mean, they're there, and uh, increasingly that, that, you know, that's where we'll find them. Is there one more comment from the right here? Thanks. Yeah, I just pointed out that the bureaucracy is run by that middle class. So I think the idea that it's going to change in five years, um, I've worked in education mm. 20, and I don't think we can change printers that fast. No. And I also think, I mean, we, we predicted that classrooms would be having, having, you know, all sorts of stuff. Classrooms look pretty much the way they did. They, 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 you know, there's more and more circles and things, but. But the egg crate classroom hasn't gone away. We've still got industrial rooms. And basically, while we've got a lot of technology, we, we, the big issue is custody. You know, we, we, we still have custody. And so the classrooms that I'm seeing, I have to say, still look pretty much the way they did, with a few more bells and whistles, and a lot of these things on the walls now, especially the girls' schools, the keep your sunny side up things. We, so we put a lot of these messages up around the walls, but um, a lot of other things don't change. And they're going to have to, if I just make this point, um, in terms of future ready, because knowledge itself is going to be created differently, a, a, an example would be the work that was done with this uh, configuration of this molecule. There, with the monkey virus, uh, there was an attempt, it's part of the HIV work, to, to create a molecule that, w that was optimal in terms of getting rid of the virus. And uh, 10 years of work in the, in the States to try to, to try to solve this problem. And then it was one of those water cooler conversations where the people working on it came across the IT people who said, what are you trying to do? They said, oh, we're, we're, trying, to, we're trying to configure this molecule. We're trying to work out what the optimal configuration would be. And they said, well, why don't we gamify it? I said, what do you mean, okay, what are you talking about? Well, why don't we gamify it? Now, they had the, the top scoring solution that was created, gamify and outsource. A lot of our knowledge is actually going to be produced that way. So to get back to that point, yes, there'll still be traditional academics and traditional, traditional settings where we're doing traditional things, where we're looking down microscopes and we're doing the things in our white coats. But what's also part of this, in, in terms of future ready, is the capacity to put things online and to, to gamify. And we have to take that seriously. 
One of the hard things I think for teachers, and I'm talking particularly about teachers because that's my background, as you can hear, but one of the hard things is to take that very seriously. And then what does it mean for us to build the capacity for serious play which underpins this? Now, if you want to go and look at more about this, go and have a look at Foldit, which is the website where you'll see where this, you're being asked to contribute to science by doing this. Um, but within, within the space of a few weeks, they had that 10-year-old problem solved. And it was solved by making it a game and putting it online. And it mightn't surprise you, but I'm saying it, the difficulty for us is how do we make sure now that our learning environments both take into account the traditional way we build knowledge, uh, looking for confirming evidence, disconfirming evidence, doubting what we've got, those things, important things about science, radical doubt, but at the same time, the, the things that we're do it, doing here now, the possibility is here. And I think the hard thing for us is if we can't, we can't really get our heads around helping kids to lean into this, then we won't be helping them to become the, the smart editors of their world. This is what we're on about now. We can't know everything there is to know. And so that increasingly the issue, what can we remember? Uh, standard tests that rely on memory, I think there are still things it's worth remembering. Um, but as someone said to me recently, one of my students said, I don't know Boyle's Law, but I can find it quicker than you can say it. And the issue is you still need, you still need to know what the principles are that we're talking about. So we need to know some things. I know that might sound a bit radical. We actually need to know some things. But, but smart editing, what makes a great gardener? I'm not a great gardener, average gardener is pruning, it's what you, what you get rid of. And trying to help young people, instead of saying, I oh, just pile up stuff, download masses of stuff, pour it all in there, is to say, pick out what it is that you prune out. Now, if we go right back to the days of Michelangelo when the papal legate came to him and said, uh, the Pope wants to see, uh, basically, your CV, what are you good at? Why should we have you doing the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel? He said, he needs to take something back that shows him your artwork. Michelangelo picked up a parchment, drew a circle, and gave it to the legate. And he said, they said, well, we can't show the Pope this. This is a circle. He said, yes, but it's a perfect circle, and I'm the only one who can do it. Wouldn't it be lovely to be able to say that? Perfect circle. But, you know, see, that was the sufficiency of that. That's sufficient. But Michelangelo knew that. That's enough. It's a perfect circle. Why would I put anything more there? And part of the smart editing of the world is for us to try to help young people get the signal from the noise. How do we get that sorted out? Can they see what the dross is and where the things are that really matter? And so that is, uh, I think, the calling for us, increasingly thinking about how do we get them to be smart editors. The people who had found the design for the monkey virus, they're smart editors. They can play with it. So we're talking about serious play, uh, not simply uh, building knowledge as it used to be done. I just want to share with you some, some uh, recent research about our top innovators and, and what, they're dis what they're like. We used to say this, and, and some of you might still do this, uh, universities have, have said we, we put out T-shaped graduates. That is... They have broad skills at the top, that is literate, numerate, can use digital, you know, help old ladies across the street, all those sort of things, communicate, you know. But also they have one deep skill, one really powerful skill, so that it might be that they grate on regression tree analysis, that's what they do. And that's their skill and they can beat anybody on that. And so that's, and that's the disposition you should be taking to the workforce. You know, the broad skills and then this one big one which is yours. So, that, and I used to say it to be very good at something. Be very good at something, anything, because then you know what it takes to be very good. Be very, whether, it's, whether it's music, gardening, driving, whatever, be very good at something. And you'll know how much unlearning you've got to do and relearning to do that. Now, now the study that was recently done for, out of Creative Workforce at QUT looked at key innovators in Australia. It took, 30, which is, I guess, just a statistical sample and no more, but, but looked at their profiles of these people and they were not like this. They were not like this. 
When they looked at them, this is what they looked like. They were key-shaped. If you'd like to see that as the teeth of a key rather than a T. They were key-shaped. That is, they had their broad skills, but they, ha they were deep in some area, had some skills in something else, very deep, so they might have still had their aggression tree analysis, but they were also good at statistics generally. They had some skills in parenting, and they dabbled in, say, 12-string guitar, you know? That, that was the, the profile. And what was interesting when we look at that profile is this, that, that what it's about is those networks. Now, if you were to look at your, your profile, which I'll ask you to do it in a minute, just in your group, if you look at your, your profile as a group, one of those would be Moodler and Moodle and, and the network. So you'd be saying, well, maybe it might be some, it might be deep. For some of you, it'll be one or the other. But the important thing here is that these innovators are people who keep a lot of their learning networks going. Not just one, not just one. They have a number of things going on, and they, they, so they develop their skills. So if they're in a choir, they, they find somebody in the choir who can help them with something that becomes one of their learning networks. So if you think about your own profile as a learner, you think about what are some of the networks that you tap into? Because this has got to be one. And obviously, from what I've heard, this is a very powerful one for you. Um, that, that it's one of the things here that you do. Can I ask you, having a look at this, just as we're finishing up, I want you to try to say, with the four of you now, you're awesome foursome. If the four of you were going to apply for a position or put yourself forward as, as value adding to a corporation, putting yourself as one entity, as a group, could you try to create a profile for yourselves? What are you very deep at as a group? I mean, it might be that, in fact, Parenting might be something that you've really all got very, very well, and you could cover that base. Or it might be mediation, or whatever it is. Back to gardening again. Create for your foursome now a profile which is, pulls it together, and have a quick talk about what that would look like. What is your key shape as a team? Way you go. Oh, you're a fivesome, you've got an edge. We can't work out, it's so hard. Well, you've got, you've got to start to think as, as the whole lot of you, you know, but, but are there things that you could double and triple dip with? So, I mean, I'm presuming that, that learning platforms are something you all, you could at least say deep for that, even if you didn't say very deep. You might want, not want to say very deep because you might have a sense of what very deep really means. But, but that might be one, you know, area. Um, but th then have a look at what else, you know, is education, is other aspects of technology, is whatever. Leaping tall buildings in a single bound. Yeah, I'll get you just to... Um, grab somebody when we give them a moment or two.
Okay. We, do we have a do we have a group? Do we have a group that can give us their key shape? Centipede. Yeah. Centipede. All right. So what what so what have you got? Can we just come down here? Right. Uh, teaching, writing, which can be blogs, news, right. Media, informative, um, IT, programming, testing, web, business analysis, you know, change management. Uh, they're, they're the ones we got through. Okay. So that's a pretty good value add for just about any corporation, looking wherever, whether, whatever you're doing, marketing or you know, whatever. So that, that covers a fair few bases. Is there anybody else who wants just to volunteer their key shape? Over, over there, please, just to, just still, I want the right. Yep, just a moment. Microphone coming. Um, our broad skill is that we are curious, that we are willing to learn and wanting to learn. Um, then we are all kind of tech savvy, or at least have two developers here in our team that can kind of bring us up above average. And we all actually speak some sort of language, whether it's a nat natural oh. one or programming one. So at least minimum, everybody speaks yet another language. And then also communicating and um, yeah, talking with each other right. and transferring. So how did you go? Would you could you add those languages into yours? I mean, if you started to think, okay, you could come and pick the eyes out of this one too to, to add. But that's a really interesting value add to put those together. You can see how that that would build into um, a, you know a really great value add. You could value add to them, who could value add to etc. We have one more up from over here. One down the front here, or just great. Uh, yeah. For our team here, we have programmers, we have administrators, we have teachers, learning designers. So, with that mix of teams or that key shape, we can open our uh, Moodle partner. Okay. <laughs> And, and uh, I guess that the issue is when you're thinking, uh, uh, you, if you got to know each other quite well, you would begin to think, of, okay, we're all dabbling here, but we, you know, we can sharpen this up there. And of course, this is part of the issue uh, that, that, that we're, we're trying to help kids build this idea, that this idea that none of us is as smart as all of us can be. And that's fundamental. So for the kid who's special, it's just all about me. It's about me and people saying how wonderful I am. This is not the world they're going into. This is it. It's how we create allies. You know, Bruno Latour made the point. Power is the accumulation of allies from one unique moment to the next. That's what power is. The accumulation of allies. What I was asking you to do is to accumulate allies. And the unique moment, what is the unique moment? What's the unique moment in the school, in the corporation, wherever it is? How do we, how do we then look for allies? Because we can't just do it by ourselves. That's why in schools we should be looking at staff room brain and classroom brain. And really understanding at a deep level how we build those cultures. Now, of course, the problem with, in, sorry, in, in schooling is, as we know, the entrenched norms have still been those of autonomy and privacy. Gulliver among the little people, you know, and we still see teachers uh, where they're very surprised and rather alarmed if another adult actually comes into the room. Now, when I hear teachers say, I'm teaching my class my way with my things, it worries me that that's not the learning environment that's going to be conducive to this. Because teaching is too hard. Teaching is an extreme sport. That's what it is. And trying to do it one out is just too hard. So as we now look at this, we're saying to ourselves, right, what do we want to do? This is not just a case of wouldn't it be nice if kids had the disposition to collaborate. Our teachers will need to model it. We need to understand it. We need to actually have them see us do it. And so they understand it's not just about you and it's not just about how wonderful you are. It's about how you get allies to do particular things and how you make a case for value adding. When do you do it, how do you do it, and how you do it respectfully. So I guess what I'm just simply trying to finish by saying is that 
If we take that principle that none of us is as smart as all of us can be, it actually looks like something. It looks like something in our learning. And if we're going to have Moodles, <coughs> Moodles that can actually build value, then we have to have a sense that, that of the importance of collaboration and we have to know it's more than just get in a group. I appreciate the fact that you did more than get in a group this morning. Um, it was great to hear that things are going so well here. I appreciate your leaning into learning uh, because we absolutely need to be able to do that, but we also need to understand that we've got to have a lot more power to our pedagogical arm. Thank you.